you so much for joining our webinar. May we be best, may we be blessed with the best year, with the best week of our lives. Tonight, Rabbi Mordechai Rodel is going to tell us about the amazing life of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, the Rebbe's father. And that is going to be followed by amazing stories of the Rebbe told to us by Rabbi Alex Kalabach. Over to you, Rabbi Rodel. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. So tomorrow night is Chaf Av, the 20th of Av, which of course marks the yard site of the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak Schneerson, who was affectionately known as Rebbe Levik. So just to give you a brief background about who this phenomenal giant was. Everybody knows he was one of the greatest Talmudic and Kabbalistic scholars of his entire generation. So just a brief, uh, a brief background, he was born, he was the oldest of four children, and his father was actually a great-grandson of the Tzamach Tzedek, the third Chabad Rebbe. And even as a small child, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak, Rebbe Levik, was known as, as, as being a prodigy. And the Friedrich Rebbe, the sixth Chabad Rebbe, wrote about him that already from a young age, his extraordinary talents were discovered. And even at a young age, he had mastered Kabbalah, Talmud, Hasidic philosophy. Um, he got smichas from the top, the top Torah authorities of his time. And uh, most famously, Reb Chaim Briske, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik of Brisk. Reb Elia Chaim of Lodge, Reb Elia Chaim Meisel of Lodge. Um, at age 22, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, suggested a shidduch for him with the daughter of the Rav of Nikolaev. Um, she, her name was Hanna, Hanna Yanovsky, and she also had earned a reputation as being quite a scholar. And... Uh, they got married. He was 22 years old, and by then he was well known. He was well known as a great scholar. Um, he was there for, for almost a decade. He stayed in Nikolaev, and then the Rebbe Rashab got him a position in what was then Yekaterinoslav, later on became Dnipropetrovsk, which today is, is Dnepr. And he became a rabbi there at the age of 31. So we're talking about the 1909. So under Tsarist Russia, he, uh, he, became a, he became a rabbi there. And eventually he actually became the chief rabbi. And he had, it was, it was quite hectic times, as you could imagine. He, he was the rabbi during the uh, bloody Bolshevik revolution and then the subsequent communist oppression. And despite or no matter what he was living through, he remained fearless. He remained defiant. He, he insisted on doing all he could to strengthen Jewish learning and observance, not only in his city, but throughout the entire country. And after the Friedrich Rebbe's arrest and exile, from Russia, it was in 1927. So Reb Levi Yitzchak actually became the leading rabbinic figure in the country, where he remained that way until his arrest in 1939. But it was long after the, the rabbis of most of the large Soviet cities either, either stepped down from their position or retained their positions but curtailed their activities Rebbe Levi Yitzchak remained steadfast. He was determined to continue everything he could, and he would regularly issue calls to all of his colleagues throughout the country to remain strong, not to be intimidated, remain firm, do all they can to strengthen Yiddishkeit. Um, in the early 1930s, he led the Ukrainian rabbi's ref uh, refusal to sign these pro-Soviet uh, papers. He, he, he was already on the radar of, uh, of the NKVD, which was the forerunners of the KGB. Um, and he did all kinds, he did all kinds of uh, illegal, illegal things. 
counter-revolutionary activities. He would uh, collect funds to support families of Jewish prisoners. He ran an entire network of underground yeshivas, of underground chadorim. Um, he oversaw the distribution of, of matzah, which came from, from abroad. He, he, he constructed illegal mikvois. Um, he, he did all kinds of crazy things, but probably one thing that really, really got him in trouble with the authorities. And the Rebbe told the story, and it's actually an incredible, incredible story, that I forgot what year it was. I think it was 36, I think it was. I think it was 1936. And it was after the communists had nationalized, you know, nationalizing all the factories and all the, you know, all the businesses and everything. So they nationalized the, the, uh, the matzah bakery. Yekaterinoslav, where he was, which was, became Dnipropetrovsk, that was known as the breadbasket of Russia. And people would come from all over the country to buy flour to make matzah. So they had a massive matzah bakery there. And of course, the government uh, took it over. And it was extremely lucrative. I mean, they could make a lot of money. And so they knew that Jews would only buy if they had a proper heksher. They needed a heksher from a rabbi. So they went to the chief rabbi, the most respected rabbi, the Levi Yitzchak. And they said, we expect you to give our, uh, your approval, your heksher. So he says, look, with the greatest of pleasure, gesundheit, on condition that you will keep strict halachic standards and you'll do whatever I say and you'll appoint, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll appoint mashgichim who will be given free reign to do whatever is needed to be done. And of course, he insisted that no water touches the, uh, touches the flower until, etc. Anyway, they were furious. They were absolutely furious. And they explained that the, the, the rules that he was insisting on would actually cause them to lose a lot of money. Because if the water um, mixes with the grain at a certain time, it, 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 it expands and you get a lot more. And uh, processing the dry grain would unfortunately result in the loss of thousands of rubles. Anyway, they put a lot of pressure. They put a lot of pressure. Eventually, he even traveled to Moscow and he met with the Chvesnish, one of the big shots there. And eventually, the government, um, the government sent the message to the ones that ran the factory and said, you have to listen to everything that Ebele Yitzchak tells you. So he stood up to them. And because of his insistence, Yidin all over the country had, had perfectly kosher matzahs to the highest standard. But I think that's basically what led to his, uh, among other things, but that was one of the last. Uh, that was one of the last things they realized that there was no winning against uh, against this man. He was just too tough, and he refused. He just refused to be intimidated. Eventually, they uh, they arrested him, and he spent more than ten months. An absolute. It was terrible with interrogations and torture and beatings through five different prisons. Some of his interrogations lasted between 15 and 16 hours until, um, until they'd be given a break for two, three hours and then it would resume. Eventually, he was given a so-called trial. They didn't even look at anything. This was in Moscow. And they sentenced him to five years in exile in some remote village in Kazakhstan. He was sent there. Eventually his wife, the Rebbe Sarkhana, the Rebbe's mother joined him and it was terrible. They actually spent about four years in the most primitive, in the most appalling conditions. They had to share this one, one bedroom house with, with the house, if you can call it a house, with this, with this uh, peasant couple and they had no door and the mosquitoes and the mud and, and, and they lived in absolute poverty. They once went an entire month without tasting bread. That's literally how, how hungry they were. And yet, despite it all, he continued learning, continued doing all he could to strengthen Yiddishkeit, even though there it was, it was, it was uh, virtually impossible. And uh, Rebbe Zahana joined him, and she would make ink out of various, uh, out of various plants and herbs and whatnot. And he would write his chidushe teira. He would write his, his Torah thoughts on the small paper, the small margins of papers that he had, um, really, really incredible that despite these difficult conditions, despite his physical health, which had really, really deteriorated after all those beatings and the, the, the harsh treatment that he had received and, and, and what he was living through, eventually it took a toll on him. He was, he was physically broken. 
the Rebbe was shown a picture of him from these uh, later years. And the Rebbe barely recognized his father. He wrote on the back of the photo, is this really my father? And I saw a difference. I'll get to, I'll get to now. I saw a difference between two different pictures taken 10 years apart. And it looks like Rebbevik had, had aged maybe 40, 50 years. You could see. You could see what it had done to him. Anyway, some friends uh, eventually raised the money to, to bribe the authorities. And he was granted permission to move to Almata, which was a larger town. There were more Yidin there. Uh, conditions were a bit better. He was able to do more for his, for his uh, brethren. Um, but unfortunately, he was still very, very sick. And he passed away in 1944 at the young age of 66. Um, in 1991, actually, the KGB formally apologized. They admitted that he was framed. Of course, it wasn't their fault. It was, you know, their, their predecessors. But um, in 1992, they sent a formal apology to the Rebbe. I was actually there in the city, in Dnipropetrovsk, in 1993. I spent a year there um, as uh, sent, by, sent by the Rebbe, as a rabbinic student. Um, and... I actually went into the KGB. Uh, they they put on they put on display a whole Jewish a whole Jewish uh, whatever it was sort of like a museum, and so I saw the original KGB file and I saw the original pictures of Reb Leibik, and you could just see the 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 torture that he had been through, the pain on his face. It was just incredible to describe. Anyway, um, and I actually met a, a number of people who remembered Reb Leibik. Remember going to the house as children, they remembered. And although I saw one particular address on the KGB uh, files, um, but some other people pointed out different homes. So when I said, hold on, but here's the address. You know, why, why are you showing me different, uh, different homes? And they explained that because of his activities, and obviously the communist authorities were not very happy with that, um, he actually had to move home every couple of years. And so he had, he had a number of addresses. Um, earlier on in, in World War I, uh, there were many, many refugees uh, coming through, through uh, Yekaterinoslav, and they ended up at the Reblevik's home, and it was just incredible. Everybody knew that was the place to go. But even afterwards, even afterwards, people would flock to him despite the dangers associated with it, people would flock to him. Today, today, Dnipro, as it's called, is not only a thriving Jewish city. It's actually, I remember when I was there, I was told that it's the fourth largest Jewish population. As a matter of fact, in the war, they used to call it Dnipro Zhidovsk instead of Dnipro Petrovsk as a uh, derogatory allusion to the amount of Jews, the number of Jews that were in the city. Uh, but today, Dnipro has the largest Jewish center in the world. It's called the Menorah Center. I think it has seven towers. And I think the greatest vindication of Reblevik's work is you could stand today on the viewing balcony, the viewing deck, on a balcony on the 18th floor in this Menorah Center. And from there, you can clearly see the KGB building. It's gray. It's, it's decrepit, and you're standing in a beautiful building, which is full of vibrant and full of growth. And uh, I think that says, that says amazing things. I just want to share a few stories about this, about this amazing man. Um, one, one, one story, one crazy story in particular is it's one night. This is in 1935. It's about 11 o'clock at night. There's a knock on the door. He goes to the door and there's a woman there. Can't come in, just make sure nobody sees her. Says, yes. She says, in an hour from now, she says, a young couple's going to come. It was either her son or daughter, I don't remember, and the fiance. And they were both government officials from another town. She says, I'm not telling you their names. I'm not telling you the town they're in. They could really get in trouble. Not only could they lose their jobs, they could lose their lives for doing this, but they agreed to have a Yiddish chuppe on condition that it would be in your house and you would do it. She says, they're going to be here in an hour, 12 o'clock, and I'm just giving you uh, time to prepare. Sure enough, 12 o'clock, uh, they come, they're quickly whisked into the side room, nobody should see them, and now the Leibach has to find a minion. 
He has to find. He has, there has to be ten men. There's him and the chassid, but you need you need eight other men. It's difficult. Twelve o'clock at night. Looking around, looking around. Eventually, they have nine men. I can't find the ten. Reb Leivik knew that there was a fellow in his building. The government would install in every building. They would they they would put somebody who was basically an informant. This person's job was to uh, write down the comings and goings of everybody. If there was any religious activity, um, they would have to report it. Even when I was there, which was after the fall of communism, was after Perestroika in 1993. And I stayed in a big building. It was called an Upshajiti. It was sort of like a motel. And even then, there was a person whose job it was to record everybody walking in and walking out. There was nobody to give it to, but he was still doing his job that they had done for so many years. They still had that position. This guy was a Jew, and he would report everything that happened. Reb Leivik sent a messenger to him. He says, come down to my house. Come down to my, to, to, to my flat. Anyway, you come to the flat, and he says, yes. He says, we're making a, a chuppah. We need a minion, and you're the 10th man. The guy jumped back. He couldn't believe it. He says, me? You're asking me? Reb Leivik says, yes, you're a yid, and I know we can count on you to keep the secret. And the guy did. The guy did. It was amazing. They brought out the, uh, the, the Kal, of course, was veiled. The Chassan tried to hide his face as much as he could. And they had the Chuppah. Everybody quickly left. Two people remained behind. And when everybody left, they came over to the Blavik and they said, we are members of the Communist Party. And they showed their, their, their membership cards. They gave it to the Blavik. They said, we belong to you. None of this nonsense. If you could do what you did tonight, and you could have that belief in a fellow Yid, whose job it is to report on you and to count on him not to, you reached his Pintal Yid. This is, this is the MS, this is the truth. Amazing, amazing story. Another beautiful story is, and I read this from a person who heard this from the man himself. The, he heard it from a man named Rabbi Yosef Nematin, who was Rabbi personal secretary for many years, up until his passing in 1944. He lived in Almata. And, um, and he, t- he took care he took care of it of Levick. Anyway, eventually in 1967, he applied to leave Russia. Of course, when you apply to leave Russia, you apply to emigrate, right away you're branded a refusenik and uh, you lose your job and uh, terrible sanctions against you, et cetera. And you, know, you really, really suffer. And they refused it. And every year he would resubmit this application to emigrate. Every year he would be refused. Even in 1979, at the height of Jewish emigration, it it had reached its peak then. He was still refused. And nobody could understand why. Some families, they would let go immediately. Some families, they would would, would, uh, keep. Some families, they would say no. Some families, they would arrest. And it was part of their plan. You never knew what to expect. Anyway, every year, he continued to give in his application. In 1982, 1982, and again, he sees the uh, he sees the envelope on the table coming from uh, coming from the government office. He opens it up, and again, it's a rejection. He was finished. He goes. He, he had looked after the. He was looking after the whole time the caver, the Blavik's caver, and so he went to his caver, and he just he he just poured out his heart. He says he says, please give me a bracha that I should go. I've been trying for years. This is great. Please give me a bracha. And then he couldn't even believe what he was saying himself, but he says, I promise you. That if I'm allowed to leave here, I will go to America and I will ask your son, who is the Rebbe, I will ask him why he's never come to visit your grave. After he said that, he like he was shocked that, that he could utter those words. I mean, that's that's Mamash Chutzpah, you know, you're talking like that way. He was shocked, but he, obviously he just it was it was it was a, a rare moment of, of intense emotional uh, outpouring of, of whatever was in his heart. Anyway, he's walking home. This is five minutes after this incident. And as he's about to come into his house, he hears somebody calling him, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yosef. He looks around. The guy doesn't even recognize. He says, don't you recognize me? I used to be your neighbor. Didn't look at him. He says, look, we haven't seen each other in over 20 years, but you used to help my blind father go to shul every single day. You took him to shul. You took him back from shul. He says, What's going on with you? You look like you're crying. You're looking in a bad way. So the basis says, I want to leave. I want to leave. And it's just getting to me. It's a year after year after year. So the guy says, you help my father. I'll help you. He says, I work in the government office and I'm well positioned to help you. He says, I know exactly who to bribe. Give me 4,000 rubles tomorrow and I will see to it right away. 
The next day, Rabbi Yosef gave him the 4,000 rubles. And within a week, he had gotten his exit visa. Anyway, he comes to New York. He comes to Crown Heights. And he had managed to take out a few of the uh, of, of Rabbi Levick's manuscripts. And most of the most of Rabbi Levick's foreign, unfortunately, they 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 when, when Rabbi Levick had to run away, he had left them with somebody else who looked after them in the in the family. They had to run away because of the war. Um, and when they came back, the family that had taken over the uh, the apartment said, "Yes, they used that as as kindling, you know, for for the fires throughout the winter." Um, anyway, so most mo most of his svarim were gone, but many of his writings. Many of his writings were, were saved and smuggled out of Russia. So this Rabbi Yosef Nemotin had had uh, had a bunch of manuscripts. Anyway, so he gives it to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe was was very thankful. He says it's an initial meeting. The Rebbe remained standing the whole time, and, and it's just incredible. And they spoke, and as he's backing out, he says the Rebbe suddenly becomes very stern, gives him a stern look as he's leaving. He says, you're forgetting that you promised my father you would ask me a question. You're forgetting to ask me. And Rabbi Yosef faints. Rabbi Yosef faints. And he realized that Rabbi Levick obviously heard and so, so did the Rebbe. I heard later, this is not from the person who heard this from, from Rabbi Yosef, but I heard later that when the Goy Shekertek, after Rabbi Yosef had left, the Goy took over, he arranged for Goy to look after the caver. And Later, when the Goy was shown a picture of the Rebbe to say, this man's son became a great Rebbe, he says, oh, I know who this is. I see him here all the time, um, which is just incredible in and of itself. Um, many, many stories that could be said. There was, there was one time, I'll just, I'll just end with this. Um, there was one time as part of the census, the government sent out, I forgot what year it was, they sent out a few uh, questionnaire, a few questions that want to know where their citizens were holding. And one of the questions was, do you believe in God? And most of the Jewish citizens, if not all of them, wrote no, because they were scared of the ramifications. What would happen if they wrote yes? When the Rebbe heard about this, he said at the pulpit, he says, this is wrong. And you have to say, you admit, you, you, you believe in God. It's very, very important. You should never deny your belief in God, no matter what may happen. One of, one of the people who heard this was a government employee. His wife had already submitted her census with the answer no. When he heard what Ablevik said, it made such an impression on him that he went back to the government office to get back her, her form that she had submitted to change the answer. When Ablevik was arrested later, this was one of the things that they asked him. He said, how could you, how could you tell people to, to say this? To which he said, I, I was doing this for the sake of the government. Jews, of course, believe. The government wants honest, truthful answers. I was, I was telling the Jews that they have to be honest and truthful. And this is what marked the Rebbeviks' approach throughout the years. Be honest and truthful. That you're a Yid, that you believe in, that you believe in Hashem, you believe in the Ebishter, never allow anything to uh, get in the way. And he devoted, he dedicated his entire life to that. Today, many of his teachings survive. They, they're... they're um, uh, they've been published, and the, the Rebbe would often speak about them. Uh, we often sing Rebbeviks Nigin. It's not, actually not a Nigin that he composed. It was sung by the Alter Rebbe, but Rebbevik loved this Nigin. Um, he would sing it especially by Sibchas uh, by Hakafis. Um, nigin a bit different than other Nigunim. It starts on a very high note. It starts with a Lebedike, a uh, very lively tune. Uh, puts you in a completely different different frame of mind. The Rebbe would start it often. Um, and and uh, how to end? The Rebbe, the Rebbe was 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 very very encouraging of anybody who would learn his father's uh, who would learn his father's learnings, uh, who would follow who would, who would follow in his father's uh, steps. And just maybe just to share a last thing, is I remember 1993 it was, so I was 1990 yeah somewhere on there. 90, I've, I forgot when, 92, don't remember when, Nin, 1992. Um, I was, I was a counselor in, uh, with the Russian camp. Anyway, we were in New York and the camp went in to, to, uh, to 770 for, for the Rebbe's every year they would go in to be with the Rebbe on his father's yard site. Obviously then this was uh, after the Rebbe's stroke and the Rebbe was, you know, was confined to his room. 
So we as a camp, all the campers, we as staff members, we stood outside the Rebbe's window. And we started singing to Rebbe. And you might have heard the song, Rebbe, oh Rebbe, we need you. You know, why can't you open the door? We were literally singing this to the Rebbe. Afterwards, we went down from Mincha, and we were told afterwards by one of the Rebbe's secretaries that the Rebbe was listening to it um, over the, uh, you know, and, uh, and that was the first time that the Rebbe tried to respond to Ommein, to the Kadeshim then, and they could see the Rebbe was trying to respond. It was the first time, the first attempt that, that the Rebbe gave um, at that. So you could see how much it meant to him, the kids on his father's yard site coming all the way. You could see how much it affected the Rebbe. They, 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 they told us this. They would be reunited with the Rebbe's father, with the Rebbe, good Gashmir, the coming of Mashiach, maybe immediately. Good luck. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Rabbi Rodel, for the beautiful inspiration you've given us about the Rebbe's father. A good fach. Welcome to all our friends, to all our listeners. And once again, a very big thank you to Rabbi Masinta for organizing such a beautiful and hopefully inspiring Malava Malka and stories of tzaddikim, as you've already heard. Chof of tomorrow night is the yard site of the Rebbe's father, who the Rebbe at Fabrengens called him not only his father, but also his teacher. And you see how the Rebbe actually followed the style of learning and teaching. And um, as Rabbi Ruddle told us so much already about the Rebbe's father. I'd like to also mention that there were two other yard sites that happened this week. One is Rabbi J.J. Hecht, who was um, a great, great man. He passed away on the 15th of, of in 1990, 30 years ago. And there are many, many stories about him with the Rebbe, being that he was especially so close to the Rebbe. Amongst the things that I heard was that he, he was sent on many missions for the Rebbe. He, he did many, many activities, including the Wednesday hour, starting the NCFJE. He started the first Balchuva Yeshiva in the world called Hadar Torah. And he was also sent on many missions by the Rebbe. And he would come back and report. He was the one who would translate many of the Rebbe's Fabrengans, especially all the rallies that were made and the Lagboma parades. He would give the Rebbe brachas. And I was told that once at a Yechidis, he had said something to the Rebbe, which the Rebbe found a little uh, not the way a Chosid should speak to the Rebbe. And he looked at him and he said, uh, you know, that's not the way. And Rabbi J.J. Hecht said, maybe it's not the way a chosid speaks to the Rebbe, but it is the way that a child speaks to a father. And since I have lost my father at a very young age, I look up to you as my father. And, he, and the Rebbe said, you know, what is special about a father? And uh, Rabbi J.J. said that he is someone I know who cares about me and loves me. To which the Rebbe said, I'm sorry, he thinks about me and loves me. And the Rebbe said, believe me, I think about you and love you even more than a father. Uh, I, I am going to try and get in all that I want to say tonight. So I'd also like to mention that the day before, it is my older brother, uh, Shimi, Shimshin ben Rebbe Freim. It is his yard site. He passed away in 2007. And I happened to be Bashgacha Pratis in Montreal at the time that he passed away. And I ended up, I went for a wedding, which I never made, but I ended up sitting shiva in Montreal with my family. 
And my brother, Shlomo Kalbach, is a very, very close friend to Yingi Bistritsky. Many of you may know him. He's very involved with Hatzola there, does many good work. And this Yingi, feeling close to my brother, flew especially from New York during the Shiva. He took a plane from New York to Montreal, rented a car, came to St. Agath, sat with us for a couple hours and went immediately back. And while he was sitting, he shared with us a couple of stories of him and the Rebbe that I would like to share with you tonight. I don't know if many people know them because they are personal stories that happened with Yingi. He was, it's, it's this time of the year, when if it weren't for COVID, people would be in camp. Uh, one of the camps that goes is Rabbi Hecht's camp is Camp Amuna, which is in the Catskills. This year they had to move out of state. The Rebbe, in fact, visited Camp Amuna when he visited Camp Gan Yisrael as well. So Yinge Bistritsky says that he and the late Fitzy Lipsker were in charge, basically, of the security of camp. So every night they would drive around. And <coughs> one night they're driving near the main building and they hear the phone ringing incessantly. Must have been about 11 o'clock at night. They're wondering who can it be who's phoning this time at night? But the phone didn't stop ringing. So finally, one of them went over, picked up the phone, and it was the Rebbe's secretary, Rabbi Chadukov, on the line. And he says that the Rebbe would like to know if the gate to the big swimming pool is locked. The guy says, I'm sure it must be. He says, well, we'd like you to go check. So they drove over to the swimming pool. And as you can imagine, it was not locked at that time. They locked it and were able to report back to Rabbi Chadukov that now the pool was locked. They could never work out, obviously, how the Rebbe knew sitting in Crown Heights that the swimming pool in the camp was possibly leading to a danger. And he told us that the same thing happened a few years later. Anyone who was in Camp Gan Yisrael in the cat schools will remember there was a fancy building there that they called the Beth for some reason. And that had an indoor swimming pool. And a few years later, the exact same thing happened. There was a call incessantly. They picked it up and they said the Rebbe would like to know if the swimming pool gates there, the, the entrance is locked at the Beth. They checked and it uh, was open. And in that way, the Rebbe averted who knows what kind of danger. The final story that he told with us is, is, is quite an emotional one, really. After the Rebbe had his stroke in 1992, on the 27th of Adar, when he was visiting the Ohel, they took turns, certain people took turns in looking after the Rebbe, being there 24 seven, if any of his needs was. And they had a list of what the Rebbe could want. And he says, one night, it was very late at night. He was there alone with the Rebbe. The Rebbe had been sleeping and suddenly began waving his arm that he needed something. So he immediately rushed to the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe all the questions. What is it that you'd like? And every question he, answer, he asked the Rebbe, would wave his arm that that's not what he wants. And the Rebbe was looking at him as if to say, can't you work out what it is I need? And he couldn't. 
And Inge says, he suddenly broke down. He burst into tears and he was more comfortable with English. And he said, you know, Rebbe, I would do anything in the whole world to help you. I just don't know what it is. Can you do me a personal favor? You know, the Rebbe had a good hand. He was, he couldn't talk, but he had a good hand. And Ingi picked up a big olive base chart that Kohasat put out. And he said to the Rebbe, I'll do anything for you. Just please point with your fingers at the different letters of the olive base what it is that you want, and I'm sure I'll be able to work it out, and then I'll know. He says, you know, there are some stubborn people in the world. The Schneerson family, as you know, is very stubborn. We heard already from Rabbi Ruddell that uh, how stubborn Rabbi Yitzchok was in the most amazing ways to keep to his values, to Teda and to Yiddishkeit. He says, but as much as stubborn as the Schneersons were, the Rebbe was the most stubborn of all. And as much as he was crying and he wanted to help the Rebbe, the Rebbe was not, for whatever reason, going to point out those letters. And so the Rebbe made with a hand, ach, you don't know what I want, just forget about it. He turned around and he went back to sleep. <laughs> those were the stories he told us at the night of the day of Shiva that he visited. But last week, we discussed amongst the Mifzoim that the Rebbe made was Mifza Tefillin. Interestingly enough, last week we read Parshish verse Hanan with the first portion of the Shema, which discusses the Mifza of Tefillin. In this week's Parsha, Parsha Seikah, we read the second portion of the Shema. And the second portion of Shema, as the first one does, also contains another mitzvah that the Rebbe made of his original five mitzvahim. And <coughs> that is the mitzvah of mezuzah. Mezuzah, the Rebbe insisted, is something that protects people's lives. And he made a campaign that everyone should go out and have kosher mezuzahs and put them out. In fact, countless of letters where people ask the Rebbe for blessings, he would say, check your tefillin and mezuzahs. I remember there was a guy in Montreal who came out. He was having terrible problems with his foot and the Rebbe told him to check his mezuzahs and where it says when you walk on your way that lamed was cracked and when he fixed that he somehow had no more problems with his feet. The Rebbe you took every letter every word of the Torah so exact and he said that the mitzvah of mezuzah, having kosher mezuzahs, can really do tremendous benefit to everybody. And I'd urge everyone to check their mezuzahs to make sure they're kosher and make sure you have mezuzahs on all the doorposts that you need, not just the front door to show it's a Jewish home, because the Torah says we should have mezuzahs on all the doorposts. One of the things I heard from the Rebbe himself happened in a very sad story. There was a group of children, school children, who went to Ma'alot from Tzvas for, for a weekend. You can look it up. In Ma'alot, there was that weekend, sadly, some terrorists, Yemach Shemom, some Arab terrorists, who took over the school and the end was that they shot up 
many of the people. And I remember the Rebbe talking about this at a Fabrengen. He said that some shluchim from Tzvas, after the whole incident in Malot, came to the school and they checked it out. And they found out, if I'm not mistaken, there were 17 children at that school who were brutally murdered. And there were another four or so who were wounded severely. More than four were wounded, but four were wounded severely. And this shliach went through the school and he found, he checked out all the mezuzahs and they found that 17 of the mezuzahs that were on the doors were not kosher. And the Rebbe said, it struck him then as quite odd that the same number of carbonus of Kedoshim that were murdered by these Arab terrorists were the same number as the amount of mezuzahs there were. And so he said, and then four of the students that were wounded severely died of their wounds. And the Rebbe wrote to these guys in Tzvas to say it was something special, that it was the same number. They should relook at the school. And they checked again, and they found that in the basement, they had overlooked a room that had four doorways, and those mezuzahs were also puzzle lining up with the same amount of children that were murdered. At the next Fabrengen, the Rebbe said, I said these words, and many people came and asked me, what am I talking about? What am I saying? How is this connected? And am I saying, God forbid, that a person who doesn't have a kosher mezuzah, this is the consequence? The Rebbe said, God forbid. That is not what I'm saying at all. And what the Rebbe explained then was the power of a mezuzah. He said, a mezuzah is like a protective helmet. Can you imagine if a person is going out to war? A helmet is a very heavy thing on your head. It could give you big headaches. It could be a big obstruction. And if the sergeant or whoever leading those guys out to war says it's too difficult to carry the helmets, to balance them and all. Everyone leave their helmets behind. And so he doesn't allow the soldiers to go out with their helmets. And the soldiers go out and some of them are lost in battle. They fall, they die in battle. So the Rebbe said, what was the cause of their loss, obviously, it was the enemy firing at them. Is there a guarantee that had they been wearing the helmets, they would have survived? No, there's no guarantee. There are many people who go to, many soldiers who go out to war, who wear helmets, who die. There are many people who go out to war without helmets who survive. He says, but what is a helmet? A helmet is an added protection that it's possible it can deflect a bullet. And the Rebbe said the same is with the mezuzah. It is not, God forbid, the lack of a mezuzah that causes any problems, but a mezuzah is an added protection. And we see so many stories of people who check their mezuzahs on the advice of the Rebbe and their tefillin, and they had miraculous savings. And I remember when the Rebbe came out with Mifza Mezuzah, I think it was the Rebbe who said that one time, normally when you check a mezuzah in America, so often the mezuzahs just had a little piece of paper in it. I remember in 1976, I was uh, in the summer by Rabbi Reichik. Uh, that year, we had a few of us go out 
uh, to Rabbi Reichick for the summer to spread Yiddishkeit. Our job was to stand on Fairfax Avenue in front of the Chabad shop to put on tefillin with people. I could tell you many stories of what happened there. But next door was another Judaic shop. It wasn't a frum shop. And they sold like this. A mezuzah cost you 10 cents because it was a photocopy of a kosher mezuzah. It was a piece of paper. Uh, the case was a dollar. If you bought the case for a dollar, they gave you that photocopy for nothing. At that time, so many people had mezuzahs, but they weren't kosher. They had just the case. Some of them were empty. Some of them were pieces of paper. I heard of some that had comic book pages in it. And the Rebbe told that there was a mezuzah they found that had a piece of parchment. And on the piece of parchment, instead of the two portions of the Shema where the Torah commands us to put on mezuzahs, there was a birches kohanim. There was the blessing of the kohanim written by a scribe and put into the mezuzah, making it not kosher. How that happened, vesach nisht. But the Rebbe would tell people to make sure that we have kosher mezuzahs. And I'd like to share another story that is actually an amazing story. It was shared with this writer in confidence. And she says she can't tell who the writer was, who it happened with, but this is the story. This lady says that she visited the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the spring of 1990. During that visit, I asked for a bracha for my sister, a blessing, who was trying to have children, but was told by several medical specialists that pregnancy was unlikely to happen. And I approached the Rebbe, she says, and I asked for a bracha. The Rebbe gave her a blessing and told her to tell her sister that she should put up mezuzahs in her home. This lady says, I never told the Rebbe that this lady, that my sister didn't have a mezuzah, but apparently she knew, he knew. So since I was in Brooklyn, I went down the block to the Judaica store. I knew my sister's house. I bought enough mezuzahs for each room of her home. I FedExed them to her and she and her husband immediately put them up. Within a year, almost to the day of my meeting with the Rebbe, my sister had a child. Two years later, she had a second child. Many years passed, and yet the miraculous blessing never left the family. Fast forward to 9-11-2001. September 11, 2001, we all know what happened with the attacks in New York City. And she says, my brother-in-law was a first responder to those September 11 attacks. And he was there as the World Trade Center collapsed. It was nearly impossible to get through and to make phone calls to anyone caught in the area that day. There was such complete chaos that for days on end, loved ones didn't know who was alive and who had died. My sister, sadly, was one of those in agony of not knowing. When she finally discovered that her husband had survived, we got to learn of yet another miracle. My brother-in-law remembers seeing a falling object about to crash down on him. That was his last memory before he lost consciousness. When he awoke hours later, he learned that a firefighter 
had saved his life by pushing him out of the way of the falling debris that would have killed him instantly. And my brother-in-law couldn't understand why him from all the people in the crowd, why did the firefighter decide to save my brother-in-law? We later learned that they had children in the same class and the firefighter had seen my brother-in-law at school events. Everything was moving so quickly. There was so much death and destruction in those moments. But the fireman's first reaction was to save the father of his child's friend. He saw that familiar face, realized that this man was about to be crushed under the debris. Instinctively, he remembered his own child and did whatever he could to save the life of another child's father. The child who was in the class of the firefighter son was none other than that miracle child born in the merit of the blessing of the Rebbe who loved every person and saw the light in everyone he met. This child, was born after fulfilling the mitzvah of mezuzah, which protects us in our homes and in our surroundings. And this was something that the Rebbe pushed so, so much. And I'd like to point out that sadly enough, today there are, the, are many, many mezuzahs that are sold that are not 100% kosher. And there are many reasons for it. And you can even go into Israel and go to the most from shops in um, whether purposefully or not, but it is so easy to get a non-kosher mezuzah. Even as I say, you could go to New York, you could go anywhere and go to, to, to places where you would be sure that the mezuzahs are kosher, and yet they are not. So Baruch Hashem in South Africa, we have places that sell mezuzahs that are 100% checked, and a person should make sure that the mezuzah they go to is, is a 100% kosher one. And, you know, the Talmud tells us about the mezuzah and it asks a question. We all know that tefillin is a mitzvah which is only obligated by men. And that is because it is time bound. We don't put on tefillin at night and we don't put on tefillin on Shabbos. So the Talmud says, since mezuzahs and tefillin are put next to each other, Maybe we should equate them and have tefillin, just like tefillin are only obligated to men, maybe the same should be said for the women. That if a woman lives in the house of another man, then it needs a mezuzah. But if a woman lives on her own, maybe she doesn't need mezuzahs, just like she doesn't need to put on tefillin. And the Talmud's answer is that a concerning the mitzvah of mezuzah, it says, Laman yibu yamechem that through having mezuzahs, God tells us, I will increase your life and the life of your children. So the Talmud says, obviously it is not only men who need the blessing of long life, but women do as well. And therefore women, even if they live on their own, need to have mezuzahs on every doorpost of their home. And in fact, they don't need a man to put it up. They can put it up and say the bracha themselves. And this is how the Rebbe showed us exactly what the Torah says, that mezuzahs, which is not the obligation of the person, but rather the obligation of the residents. In fact, that's why it makes no difference who lives there. And it is something 
that increases a person's life and and his health. And I'd like to 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 conclude with with a story not about mezuzah so much, but a story that happened in Johannesburg with a family. Many of you may know him. He used to tell that story quite often. His name is uh, Alex Moraney, and he and his wife were struggling very much to have children. And they wrote to the Rebbe and asked for a bracha to have a child. And the Rebbe crossed out the word child and wrote that his bracha is to have children. And they were very bewildered by that aspect. And a year later, they understood why the Rebbe had changed the word child to children when Bar Hashem, they have the Moraini twins. They had twin boys. And this is something, as I say, that the Rebbe told us goes very much in hand. The man yibu The Rebbe would tell people if they needed cures, they had problems with their hearts, which is mentioned in the mezuzahs and tefillin. They had problems with their feet. They had problems with their health. They had problems having children. Make sure to have kosher mezuzahs on every door. Make sure to have kosher to fill in. It's beautiful to put them on. But unless they are kosher, we are not fulfilling the mitzvah properly. And I'd like to urge you, especially as we come up to the month of Elul shortly, and we were told that in the month of Elul, Yiddish should make sure to check that to fill in and mezuzahs. Let us do the mitzvahs of the Teda, which promises us for Hoya Im Shamaya, Tishmu, that by obeying, by following the mitzvahs of the Teda, by following the directives of the Rebbe, we will all see health, gesund, and nachas. And I want to bless us all. We have been locked down as far as the shuls go since March 19th. If I recall correctly, that was the last day we had a minion in our shul. Shenganuk, we ask the God Almighty, we accept everything he does with perfect faith, but we ask him, Ad Mosai, how long? How long do we have to be locked down Right now we're locked down in our houses, but the world is locked down in an exile. Ad Masai, we are doing what we can to do the mitzvahs, to do the mitzvahim, to follow the directives of the Rebbe. We know that the Rebbe remains with us. And in the schus of the Yotzat of his father, may we properly see light coming through, light shining up the exile. May we be married to the final redemption, the Karev. And together we'll see the Neshamas of the outside coming back and having true Giyula. Thank you. A good Vach to all of you. Order of the day. He won't machine. What does the Zechit a beer the Hesbet? A Bishar's the door a talk from a yard side. 
הלך הסכמנו וקמנו פונה גודל בישרו הלך הסכמנו וקמנו פונה זמי וסוד צריך מסר נפש גבר על הכלל ומתון גנו מזין מסיר אס נפש ביז מסיר אס נפש בפייר כליס הנשום מהגוף ונדוסי גוון בנגי צודיוצי תון בנגי צודם בעל היוצאת, בעל הילולה, ועוזבן מגוון לכלייס הנפש מן הגוף בפייל, ועודוסי נחמרת בנגי צו אופטון, בנגי צו זיך ומצערום זיך ומנגי אולמיילו, בזמן נתעשי גוון כדאי.